Mangat the Kian Corla. The Tishuk in his speech this morning says that there are three steps to economic recovery. Wrong, Tishuk. There are four, and you always keep forgetting and omitting the fourth. And the fourth is jobs, getting people back to work and addressing through labour market measures the needs of the people who have lost their jobs and who are going to lose our jobs in the economy. The Labour Party agrees that, yes, we need to get the Lisbon Treaty passed on the 2nd of October, and that is why we are campaigning in favour of it. We will engage constructively on the debate that we will inevitably have about the public finances and what to do about that, although I suspect we may disagree about some of the measures that will have to be taken and we will be advocating a fairer way. And on the issue of the banks, about what is needed to get our banks functioning again and lending to business, the Labour Party disagrees with the proposal that the government has put forward on that issue. NAMA is the wrong fix for a crisis that should never have happened. NAMA is a scheme to nationalise losses and privatise profits. It is a scheme that exposes the state and the taxpayer to unnecessary and excessive costs and risks. It is a scheme that will undermine the competitiveness of the Irish economy for years to come. I need hardly remind the House of the importance of this bill. The decision we are being asked to make on NAMA is enormous in terms of the quantum of resources. It is enduring in terms of its impact on the economy and the public finances, and it is irreversible in respect of any future government. A decision, it would appear, has been made by the government to commit 54,000 million euro, that is 54 and nine zeros, deliberately overpaying for bad property loans. If the minister's figures are right, that overpayment amounts to 7 billion euro. But only if the figures are right. No matter what the odds, it's a 54 billion euro bet. But are the figures right? I have to say, Count Corla, that there are aspects of these figures which were presented by the Minister for Finance yesterday that make me deeply uneasy. In his speech yesterday, the Minister for Finance said the following about his view of where the property prices are and where they are likely to go. And I quote, he says, the fall in property prices has pushed up property yields. Yields are now above their long-term average, and this suggests that values are bottoming out. The Taoiseach repeated that again today, where he says, NAMA will have to achieve less than a 10% uplift over current market values on its assets over 10 years to break even. I was struck yesterday when I heard the Minister for Finance say that the assessment is that the market value of the, is 47 billion euro. I had to say to myself, well, where did we get this market value from? And where do we get this assumption that it is going to lift by 10 to 15 percent, uh, which will give NAMA the return? And we find in the document, this green document that the minister supplied us with, that the, all of this is based on assumptions that are made about yields and about rents. Let me tell you a few things about rents and where the Minister for Finance is wrong. Rents, commercial rents in this country, cannot be reviewed down. You have a law in the statute book which says that commercial rents can't be reviewed down. Now, I know you will say that you've changed it, but you've only changed it for future leases. We have people all over this country, retailers, who committed themselves to long leases in new shopping centres at the height of the property boom, and they cannot get a downward revision on those rents because there is a law in this country that says you can't review downward rents. That's why commercial rents are high. Residential rents are still high because only recently, it's only in recent years, that your government, at our behest and request from the Labour Party, and I know from Fine Gael as well, brought in a piece of legislation which regulated the private residential uh, uh, tenancies uh, sector uh, at all. We know that many of, the many of the tenancies are not registered at all with the new Residential Tenancies Board. We know that the Residential Tenancies Board has at best only examined a minority, a tiny minority uh, of tenancies with regard to their, uh, to their rents as to whether they are market value. And I keep meeting people, I keep meeting people 
who are still paying the rent for their apartment or their home that they were paying three years ago at the height of the boom when those rents were driven up by high, by high property prices. And even those that have dropped have not dropped in line with the <coughs> drop in property prices. And of course, the state itself is contributing to the high levels of rents that we have. In the, in the residential sector, the state is paying through rent allowances a, rental, a very high rental subsidy for something like 60,000 tenants. And in addition to that, you have the state, which itself is a tenant. You have the state, for example, paying. We've, we are paying something like, uh, I saw a figure recently of something like 60 million euro that is being paying, paid for rental office properties, much of which will not be used because now the decentralization proposals are not going ahead. So the Minister for Finance's entire house of cards in relation to the, the commercial, the market value of the properties, the 47 billion, and his assumptions about the 10 to 15 percent increase is based on a rental sector uh, and on a rental regime and on rental yields, yields which are not normal. And all of these tables that he produced comparing rental yields in Dublin with uh, Rome and Oslo and so on is not comparing like with like. And it worries me, it worries me that we have now uh, got an approach to NAMA which is based on such, a flimsy, uh, on, on, on such a flimsy basis. And then we have the risk sharing. Last week was risk sharing week. Big victory, we were told, had been won by the Green Party. And what do we get in the Minister's statement? We're told that risk sharing will be 5%, as small as it possibly could be. The so-called risk sharing is no more than a puff of green smoke, a derisory concession to an ineffectual party whose only value now are the numbers that are required to keep uh, Fianna Foyle uh, in government, but, who, but uh, who have sold both themselves and the Irish public short. This decision to establish NAMA is being made in the cold light of day. It's not like the night of the blanket guarantee when the government could at least claim that its profound errors were made in the face of fast-moving events. This is a decision being made after the government has had every opportunity to seek advice and to seriously consider all of its options. This is a moment when the government could have achieved a unity of national purpose, when we could have come together to address the banking crisis in a manner that would gain support from across the political divide, in a manner that would put the taxpayer first. But that opportunity too has been spurned, and instead what we got from the Minister for Finance yesterday was an exercise in partisan bluff. We've got a decision that lines up perfectly with a long series of decisions during the property bubble and the housing, housing crisis. Another decision to put the interests of property developers and banks first at the expense of the taxpayer. Every single decision, every U-turn, every twist in the tail has put the banks first. The status quo has been protected, the taxpayer has been left to pick up the tab, and after all that has happened, rather than moving to prevent another crisis of this kind, NAMA will pre pre preserve the very interests and structures that brought about it in the first place. There are a number of points in this debate on which we can all agree. Firstly, that there is a banking crisis and that it needs to be addressed urgently. A modern economy needs a functioning banking system and the large retail banks are part of the nervous system of the Irish economy. We need these banks in particular to be capable of normal lending to families and businesses across the country. It's a simple point, but one we cannot lose sight of. Business needs credit. Everyone knows that there is a severe credit crunch affecting small business in particular. According to the most recent statistics published by the Central Bank, this credit crunch got worse in the second quarter of this year. Lending to the non-property, non-financial sectors declined over the quarter by 3.3 billion or 6.2%, with the largest falls in absolute terms being recorded by the manufacturing and wholesale retail sector trade. The annual rate of change in credit to these sectors fell to minus 7.7%. Credit extended to these sectors has declined on a quarterly basis for three successive quarters and the pace of decline is increasing significantly during the second quarter of this year. These figures match the experience of the people that I talk to up and down the country, despite the protestations of the banks and of the Minister. To deal with this credit crisis, we need to clean up the balance sheets of the banks so as to restore confidence in them and to ensure that they can resume normal lending. This process must focus in particular on the two large retail banks. Those two banks are deeply embedded in the Irish economy. 
They have been built up over decades and have a deep reach into the communities in which they function. They cannot be quickly replaced. They simply must be in a position to lend if the economy is to function. The second reality that must be faced is that there are constraints on government action, particularly in, form of the, in the form of the blanket guarantee. The Labour Party did not agree to that guarantee, and we didn't vote for it. But it is there, and it acts as a severe limitation on the options now available to the government. From the minute the guarantee was put in place, the Irish taxpayer was always going to be lumbered with the bad loans in the banks to a greater or lesser degree. The question with which we are now faced is how to deal with them. The balance sheets of the banks must be cleared up so that lending can resume or the economy will contract further. We will see more and more firms and more and more jobs that would otherwise be viable go under for want of credit. Equally, as the world economy begins to recover, the absence of liquidity will restrict Ireland's capacity to share in that recovery. This must be done at the least cost to the taxpayer, but the government has issued a blanket guarantee, meaning that the taxpayer is exposed. The question is how to limit the risk to the taxpayer while restoring the flow of credit to the economy. There are essentially, therefore, two options available. The first is NAMA, the second is temporary nationalisation. And let's be clear, neither of these are great options. The crisis is too deep for that. Either approach will be costly, but one is manifestly better for the state than the other. Temporary nationalisation limits the risk to the taxpayer, NAMA increases that risk. NAMA is based on a deliberate policy of overpaying for the bad loans. Temporary nationalisation removes the risks involved in having to value the loans. Fianna Fáil have been trying to persuade people that it doesn't matter how you deal with the banking crisis. In their version, the losses are the losses. That is simply not With the temporary nationalisation approach, there is no policy of deliberate overpayment and the state stands to gain when the bank is sold again. But with the NAMA approach, the taxpayer assumes an unacceptable risk. The government knows all this. The issue has been debated in great detail in the media, old and new. The overwhelming majority of independent economists, of all political viewpoints and none, is that temporary nationalisation is a better option. Yet the government is choosing to push ahead with NAMA. It is impossible to avoid the conclusion that the government is deliberately choosing to place the interests of banks above the interests of the taxpayer. What we also see right through this legislation is a determination to preserve the status quo, to protect the toxic triangle of developers, bankers and bad government that got us into this mess in the first place. We saw it in the case of Anglo-Irish Bank, where the determination to avoid nationalisation led to the blanket guarantee and a subsequent nationalisation on the worst possible terms for the taxpayer. We see it in the determination that all costs uh, at all costs, further nationalisation should be avoided, which is what is driving the determination to overpay for the bad loans. We see it in the refusal to shake up the boards of the banks, and we see it in the extraordinary powers that the government is assigning to itself in how NAMA will function. We should probably not be surprised that we're being asked to bail out the banks and property developers in this way. NAMA is simply another step in a long line of decisions that favoured property developers over many years. A recent study of the Irish housing sector by the Jesuit Centre for Faith and Justice provides a picture of how housing policy has developed under this government. They note, for example, that between the mid-1970s and the mid-1990s, the price of housing in Ireland broadly tracked the cost of building a house. After the mid-1990s, however, there was a surge in the price of housing which bore no relation to the cost of the relevant inputs. By 2007, house prices had risen by four times as much as building costs. The average price of a new house in Ireland increased by 344% between the mid-1990s and the peak of the bubble, rising from €73,000 to €323,000. In Dublin, there was a 408% increase over the same period. Average second-hand house prices increased by 441% and 499% in Dublin. Now, needless to say, wages were not increasing by the same amounts. In fact, if new house prices had tracked the increase in earnings, that price, average house price, 323,000 in 2007, would have been only 124,000 euro. Of course, when an economy starts to boom, you can expect house prices to rise. 
but you might also expect that the government would do something about it. As long ago as 1999, the Labour Party was addressing that whole issue of housing policy in a comprehensive manner. In February 1999, the Labour Party established a commission under Professor PJ Drudy of Trinity College to advise the party on a wide range of housing issues, including the crisis in affordability that was then facing young couples. That report explicitly identified a number of factors that were leading to escalating house prices, including the lax lending policies of the banks, the impact of speculation on the housing market, and the effect of property-based tax reliefs. The report made a series of recommendations covering a wide range of housing policy, but with a particular focus on affordability. Again and again over the past decade, Labour raised the question of spiralling house prices, and again and again we were ignored. In 2003, the Labour Party made a submission to the All-Party Committee on the Constitution, making it clear in our view that there was no constitutional impediment to the implementation of the Kenny proposals to control the price of building land. We followed that up with a bill to give effect to the Kenny formula, which was again rejected by the government. For its part, the government twisted and turned in every possible way to avoid confronting this issue. Certainly they commissioned reports and promised action, but that action either did not materialise or in some cases was reversed before it could have any impact. More and more, housing was treated as an instrument of a speculation and accumulation rather than as a basic human need. If you ever want a more telling statistic about how Fianna Fáil has deserted its roots in the last 10 years, then you will find it in the figures on social housing. In the 1930s and 1940s, social housing amounted to 60 to 70 per cent of all housing output. As late as 1985, the public sector was responsible for 27 per cent of output. But in the boom years of 1995 to 2006, that fell to just 6 per cent. Again and again, the Labour Party called for action, yet nothing was done. At the same time, Fianna Fáil blatantly flaunted their connections to property developers and speculators. Those lavish Fianna Fáil election campaigns, which took political spending in Ireland to new heights, had to be financed somehow. Fianna Fáil, frankly, didn't care how any of this looked, and it looks pretty shabby now. Meanwhile, all of this was having a damaging effect on our economy. As the construction bubble gained momentum, more and more labour and resources were sucked in and became dependent on the construction sector. By early 2007, more than 20% of all male employment was in construction. As a result, the competitiveness of the exporting economy was undermined. After 2000, Irish export performance began to flag. The export boom that Fianna Fáil inherited from the government that it took over from in 1997 petered out as the current account of the balance of payments turned negative. Of course, it is natural for any people who have gained new wealth to want to spend it. It is entirely normal to expect consumption and housing output to grow in the wake of an export boom. The purpose, however, of economic policy is not growth for its own sake, but to provide more employment and higher standards of living. But the people who are supposed to be in charge, the people whose duty it was to protect the economy, were at best asleep at the wheel. Fianna Fáil were in charge, it was they who were supposed to ask the right questions, to ensure that the banking system was properly regulated, to prevent the build-up of risk in the banking system, and you failed in that duty. If you want an example of how the system was asleep, look at Irish Nationwide. I know the main focus of attention today is on the large institutions. But you do have to ask the question as to how a small building society like Nationwide acquired a commercial loan book of €8 billion. Euro. How was that allowed to happen? The pity of it is that action of any kind at any stage would have at least lessened the impact of the banking crisis as it is being felt today. In a bubble of this kind, the worst excesses often happen just before the crash comes. This commitment to the bubble economy has also been in evidence throughout the handling of the banking crisis. Through every U-turn and policy switch, there has been a common theme. Protect the banks and the bankers. Avoid nationalisation. We now know, for example, that on the night of the blanket guarantee, 30th of September uh, 2008, the Department of Finance had prepared a bill to nationalise Anglo-Irish Bank. Instead, the government put in place a guarantee for the whole banking system, including Anglo, which now represents 28 billion of the toxic debt that we have to take over. 
Anglo was kept alive for another three months, during which time significant bonuses were paid, and it was January before the inevitable happened. The structure of the guarantee was in itself inexplicable, since it covered parts of the bank's capital. It has never been properly explained why dated subordinated debt was covered by the guarantee. Bonds that are supposed to be available to absorb losses in certain circumstances were guaranteed by government. Why? No adequate explanation has ever been given. Nor have we seen concerted action to reform the banks. There have been some changes at senior management and at board level, but change has been little and slow. Last week, the Irish Times published a profile of the boards of the six covered institutions. There have been significant changes in Anglo and in Irish Nationwide at board level. But look at the boards of the other banks. Leaving aside the two public interest directors, nine out of the ten people on the board of AIB have been in place since before 2008. In Bank of Ireland, the figure is 10 out of 12. In EBS, 8 out of 11. And for Irish Life and Permanent, 6 out of 8. With all due respect to the individuals involved, those boards have failed. Yet the government has done little or nothing to remove them. When firm action in this respect would have cost them little, and yes, would have contributed to restoring confidence in the Irish economy and in Irish sovereign debt. And even now, with all we know, it is clear that the lessons have not been learned. The NAMA bill before the House is intended to protect the toxic triangle, not break it up. Worse than that, it will create an unhealthy alignment of interests for future governments to contend with. From now on, whether implicitly or explicitly, every government policy will have to be NAMA proofed. Every measure proposed to be taken will be assessed on the criterion what will this do to property prices and what impact will it have on NAMA. The state will have an enormous vested interest in restarting the property boom, in getting property prices back up as high as possible, and NAMA will, in that sense, have to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Everything possible will be done to ensure that it succeeds. And if anyone doubts that this is so, look at the governance structures within NAMA as proposed in this bill. The bill vests extraordinary powers in the Minister for Finance and extraordinary dis discretion in, the, in deciding how NAMA will operate. There is a general statement in Section 9 that says that except where otherwise provided in this Act, NAMA is independent in the performance of its functions. However, there are many places where there are otherwise provided for so that it is not independent but must act at the direction of the Minister. And I believe that it is important that we identify these. In the long title, Section 65, it makes it clear that NAMA's function is to acquire certain assets from certain persons to be designated by the Minister. It is also to perform such other functions related to the management as are directed by the Minister. In Section 11, the Minister may confer on NAMA by order such additional functions connected with, the fu uh, with uh, NAMA as he or she thinks fit. The designation of eligible bank assets to be pur purchased by NAMA is a power vested by Section 67 in the Minister for Finance. Section 13 of the Bill requires NAMA in the performance of its functions to have regard to any guidelines issued by the Minister, and in Section 14 it sets down the pow Minister's powers of direction whereby the Minister may give a direction in writing to NAMA concerning the achievement of the purpose of this Act. There is one area where ministerial discretion is particularly worrying, and that is where it is related to the determination of acquisition values. Again, it is important to list the specifics.